And we are live with the next talk at me in C 2022. A little bit of a surprise, we have four speakers on this talk. Uh, Paul Keir, Andrew Jules, and Joel Falku. Um, and we'll be swapping through those slides and a little bit be an experiment. So stick with, stick with us. Um, looking forward to the talk. Um, let me bring up the title slide for this talk. Um, Joel, you have the word. Take the take it away. Thanks, Jens. Uh, thanks for having us at Meeting C Plus 2022. Uh, always a pleasure. So um, we will be talking about um, making a context first standard library, uh, among other things. Uh, I will be uh, speaking together with uh, a bunch of co-workers and colleagues from all around the place, uh, namely Paul Kerr, which is a, a lecturer at uh, uh, UWS. Uh, Andrew Gozilon is former PhD student, which is now working at AMD. Uh, Jules Penuchot, which is my own uh, PhD student right now, and myself, uh, Joel, which is a um, associate professor at University of uh, Paris Saclay. So we will all be talking about uh, doing this context per um, experiment around the standard library. So let, let's let's start by having a bunch of context around the work uh, being done there. Um, as you may know, um, template meta programming has been uh, a subject for a very long time. Uh, it's probably one of the oldest tricks in the C++ development books. It has been, you know, uh, a, a large majority of the time be something that people were looking at as a kind of a hack things, uh, where a lot of ugly code needed to be written. And since those old times, uh, template data programming evolved quite rapidly, first through uh, tools like Boost MPL, Boost Fusion that were later um, up upgraded, updated, replaced by all the version of those, uh, like Boost MP11, Boost Anna, and a lot of others. But the main change in how uh, we look at template programming is the, the fact that the context per keywords and facilities that were introduced in C++11 and usually upgraded uh, in C++17 and 20 completely changed the way we have to think about doing stuff with templates and trying to force our compilers to behave in a, some, you know, unorthodox way. Um, the cool thing about using Constexper as a main tool for template metaprogramming is that it turned template metaprogramming into actual programming, as we will be seeing uh, in a few moments. We are now writing code that may pass as regular code, okay, uh, but is actually doing metaprogramming somehow. And it pushed metaprogramming into uh, what it was from the beginning, and even if it was not obvious, is that template metaprogramming and metaprogramming in general, it's a tool to write automated code generation. And this automation level is now more uh, obvious to everyone thanks to the simplification brought by Constexper. Yet, well, uh, if the, the benefits from Constexper are mostly obvious, as I say, metaprograms look better, we have less need uh, than before of specific libraries uh, to write complex template metaprogramming, and we can write the code uh, in a runtime fashion, debug it, and then turn it from uh, We are still missing a bunch of elements. Um, even through a lot of efforts that we will be discussing, uh, we are still lacking a bunch of elements to get to a, a perfectly massively constexper standard library. We have a lot of things that we'll be discussing that are new and we'll be using them, but we are still missing things. There is a problem of compile times, which is always an issue. And we try to see how we can find, well, a um, creative way to get other, around that. And we will try to focus on how we can actually turn all of this into a proper uh, code generation process. And uh, in the time that will be uh, ours now, uh, I will let Paul speak about this context per standard library. Uh, Jules will be speaking about compile time code generation, trade-off and techniques. And Andrew uh, will try to uh, give us an insight on how uh, those compile times can be tackled on. 
Uh, all in all, what we want to achieve with this talk is try to get uh, a large, broad spectrum of uh, interesting techniques uh, around contextures and how they can be structured in a meaningful way. I will now uh, pass uh, the stage to Paul that will be speaking about uh, our implementation of a context first stand up library components. Paul, up to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Joel. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll give a, a little introduction to Say here before moving on quickly. For the moment, I'll just say that Say is a, a non standard version of the C standard library that we have. Um, with extended support for compile time evaluation. Its purpose is to facilitate research into larger compile time program engineering, and it should also help to port existing projects which use the C++ standard library to the compile time concept domain. Um, but before we have a, a closer look at Say and a, 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 a relevant porting project that we've we've tackled. I want to first review some recent Constextra features that have made it so that Say is now possible. So, I want to talk about first of all dynamic memory allocation, um, which is now since C plus plus twenty um, accommodated within the constant evaluation um, domain. So. We have, for example, the familiar new and delete operators available to us and uh, accessible within context for programs. Um, a context for function needn't run at compile time, which is, is great. It can or, or, or may not, uh, depending on its context. And so it will be that um, certain scenarios will compel uh, a context for function to attempt to run at compile time. For example, it can be um, within a static assert, it can be um, initializing a, a context for a variable declaration, or it can be that it's provided, uh, the function call return value is provided as an argument uh, to an NTTP um, parameter. Um, and the way that we're in general uh, making use of this, at least in our testing, which I think is, is nice to look at the, the general scheme on the right hand side. So we've got, um, a context for a function called all okay. We can see that since C plus plus twenty, what we can we can do is is call the new operator, dynamically allocate uh, space for the integer there, initialize it. We can then test to see that that happened. So we can uh, initialize that boolean there, and hopefully that will end up true. But we need to also delete, and then we return the value which is hopefully true that came from the, the context for a function. And then we can kind of doubly test it both at runtime and at compile time. So we call the uh, the runtime assert function on the same uh, function with the same parameters, none, as we do on the line afterwards here at the bottom on the static assert. And, you know, so if we can compile that, the static assert has worked. If we can then run it, then the runtime assert has worked. These dynamic memory allocations um, should be transient allocations only, um, which uh, can have a little bit of an explanation here. Essentially, all the allocations uh, that we have uh, obtained um, during compile time evaluation must be freed before uh, constant evaluation concludes. So if you now look at the right hand side again, I've made a, a, a change here. So I've removed the call to delete. Um, but that will now produce a compilation error if we try and compile that. Um, and that's due to the, the static assert here. If we re remove that, we can get rid of the, the compilation error. But uh, the static assert will produce a compilation error because I am not free in memory that I've allocated. Somewhat reminiscent of a Valgrind memory leak check. Um, in C20, we also have vector and string. Um, They've, they've appeared um, fairly recently in the, the standard libraries, and um, that's, uh, that's since Louis Dion's P0980 and P1004 proposals. So now vector and string can be used, and there's an example of how they could be used, a rather trivial example below. You can see that we can create a vector, have some values in it. We can create a string, um, set it to something, we can then check that the values are as we expect, essentially forming the bool 
that we, we looked at earlier on. Um, and if that uh, goes according to plan, uh, then static assert will be happy with the, the true value being returned from that and all is good. Um, so that's vector and string. I'd like the, to bring this uh, towards the point of um, how you should use the vector and string. Um, it's not the case that you can just declare a const extra vector or string, um, which is sometimes surprising because when you hear that uh, vector and string are available uh, or with const extra support, it might be the first thing you would write is maybe something like maybe the, the, the bottom two lines. I guess the point I want to make here is really that this, this uh, will produce an error. This, um, well, actually, th this code will produce three errors if you try to compile it. Um, and the first is, is probably the more obvious as to what has gone wrong. Um, the, the memory is not um, being used transiently here. Um, the memory that has been allocated at compile time for the, the double, so the new has been um, called and has returned space for the, uh, the double and initialized it accordingly. But the free is not called there. So the, the, this can't work. Um, this variable p would otherwise be available within a function or if it was a global variable, um, it would the user would expect that that would have the value 0 0.577 etc but that's not going to happen we have to free that memory and it's clearly not happening there so the point is that it's also not happening here with the vector and with the string so this form is not allowed unlike the previous slide where we 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 see that the constructor and the destructor of vector and string are both called so at the end of the call to string vector OK, the destructor frees that memory and we are allocating memory transiently as we should. Trivially, just for argument's sake, we can access a standard const expert container at runtime when it doesn't allocate. So here, uh, trivially, we've initialized the, the P pointer, const extra to null pointer, fine, no allocations. Um, so too for the, the vector V here, no allocations made, string much the same, although uh, Clang uh, will give an error uh, on that currently, and Visual Studio and GCC are happy enough. The code is as below, um, just to test that trivially, so we can check that the pointer is, is null pointer, the vector is empty and the, the string does not contain, nope. When we're Working with um, the standard library, we have to be working with allocators as well. So all containers of the C++ standard library support custom allocators from the user. So we have to uh, respect that. The containers allocate storage with default construction. Um, and by default, it will be the uh, STD allocator class, which can be used. And we can show some example code with that to get us up and running. Um, so if you've not used allocator before, um, it's going to be a little bit like malloc. I'm not sure if that's any more familiar to anyone right enough, but it's a little bit like malloc in the sense that it's it's essentially just allocating memory. It's not actually constructing or, um, or, or calling the constructor in any of the, um, the memory that's been allocated. And much of STD allocator is now marked const extra uh, since C++ 20. So it goes along with the new and delete being available. We also have uh, allocators. Uh, member functions are largely also const extra as well. So here you can see a uh, simple uh, program making use of uh, the standard allocator as well. It allocates 1,024 integers and then deallocates them immediately afterwards. So uh, that const extra function is fine. And uh, yeah, it's void, so all good. Um, but one thing to notice is that um, when you're writing to allocated memory of simple types, for example, I've ex extended this example a little bit here to write to the 42nd element of the, the, um, the memory, which was allocated and targeted by P. And it can be common practice to start writing to that memory, uh, given that it's been allocated, perhaps also by something like malloc. 
But this actually causes undefined behaviour. No int object was actually created and its lifetime never started. And this was noted as a somewhat long-standing defect in uh, P0593 proposal uh, from Smith and Butelainen, uh, entitled Implicit Creation of Objects for Low-Level Object Manipulation. And that pro proposal was subsequently adopted into uh, C++20. So code stays the same, but just to say that that adopted paper then defines implicit lifetime types. And these are types where creating an instance of the type runs no code and destroying an instance of the type runs no code. And so such types are given some leniency on this um, observation about the undefined behavior uh, and, and the alternative usage or the, the prior usage. Because undefined behavior is not permitted within, uh, or it's not permitted uh, during constant evaluation. So there, there's an issue there. And this is, has now been identified as undefined behavior. But for these implicit lifetime types, some, um, some leniency has been provided. So such types are, are now permitted uh, to be implicitly created in code such as you see above, uh, but not during constant evaluation. So uh, section 3.5 of the proposal makes that quite clear. And it's also in the uh, C++ standard, so as well. So consequently, there's just uh, one more thing to consider when you're doing your dynamic memory allocation at compile time. Um, it's not so relevant really for library level development, but uh, for legacy code that might exist and it's, it's being ported, this can often be um, a, an obstacle. Um, so since C++20, we've got STD construct app to provide some appropriate syntax to let us um, use the memory that has been allocated. So here we can see the construct app call has been, um, been provided with the address of the 42nd element of P just before we use it, or at least sometime before we use it. And so now that code is good and it, will, uh, it can be part of constant evaluation now. Um, we could put something like that around as well, which would um, just uh, ensure that that only ran uh, during constant evaluation. Um, and then moving to code that just looks a little bit more like you would find within the standard library, we, we typically will require to construct all array elements after creation. And so we need to, to as, I'd mentioned, as I'd mentioned earlier, respect custom allocators uh, provided by a user, and that can be done using std allocator traits. And so the code becomes something like this, which is not much different. It's just it's not construct at, it's construct now uh, coming out as a as a member of the, the allocator traits specialized for the allocator that you're interested in. Um, so that now initializes all of those integers. Um, so there's certainly no problem with using the 42nd element. Um, there's a recent proposal, which um, may end up in C++23, it's P2674, and it uh, offers an is implicit lifetime trait, uh, which might allow us some more precision here to ensure that it's um, only, the, uh, only the types that are implicit lifetime that are um, maybe constructed. If you want runtime and compile time code to be exactly the same, that could be quite handy. Um, I wonder if it, it would be good to now in, in C23 or 26 to um, remove that restriction on the implicit object creation um, that, that is gone from runtime um, but still exists during constant evaluation. And perhaps more, more simply, I wonder if construct n might be a nice uh, addition rather than destroy or which would go along with destroy n, which does exist. Um, yeah, of course, when porting programs to Consexpro, these details will require some care. Um, and GCC and Visual uh, Studio are lenient, or Visual C++, I should say, but Clang throws an error, uh, which you know, I believe is the correct behavior. But nevertheless, I, I also appreciate that, uh, well, with GCC and, and Visual Studio, we, we don't receive an error, which can, well, ultimately, it's got to get resolved. Um, 
before your code can be um, good. So now turning back to C again and how it might be used. So the C++ standard library, as it is at the moment, C++ 20 standard library, it may in time um, become entirely const extra. That's uh, debatable. Uh, but meanwhile, the C library can be used today. So we've created this um, version of the, the standard library, incomplete as it is, um, but which attempts to um, create uh, compile time versions of all of the functions, uh, entities, um, classes that you know from the standard library. It's quite away from completion, to say the least, but we have made some progress and we want to let you know how we're, we're getting on. Um, for us, we're doing things like verifying string-based embedded DSLs, and we're also exploring code generation. Um, we have support and complete support for forward list, list, set map, DQ, Q, I, string, stream, unique pointer, shared pointer, exception, and function. Um, say is not standalone. Uh, lib stdc++ is required, and its code is also used within say as well. Um, established const expert entities from lib stdc++ are naturally just wrapped uh, within say. So now we're kind of at the point where we can wrap um, vector and string, but we've got our own implementation of vector and string in there as well. But but um, the parts which we've, we've never uh, implemented ourselves because they've always been available um, or at least when we've turned our attention to them, but we've got algorithm, uh, numeric, the contents of, of most of, the, of, of those headers. Um, as I said, vector string, we've got array inside the, the say namespace, we've got optional <coughs> pair and variant. Say now supports uh, recent versions of GCC and Clang, and uh, the GitHub repository is linked as, as shown. Here's a a small example code of say, it fits on a slide. It doesn't do much sensible, but it tries to make use of a fair few features that we've got. So you can see we, we have a string, we can initialize it. Uh, vector is being initialized with one, two, three, DQ, two, three, four. We've got a set with nothing in it at the moment. We call set intersection, it intersects the, the DQ um, with the vector. So that's going to be the elements it had that, that are in common, which is two and three. It, they're used with the inserter to initialize or to uh, add elements to set. Um, then a, a function is, is created, an STD function style function. Um, it's created uh, from a lambda. Within the lambda, we call accumulate. We uh, traverse across the set. Um, X is then initialized by the, the value obtained from calling F. And so finally, we can, well, note that this line is something that will just execute at runtime, um, as, as I point out at the top. Um, the IO commands, uh, we've chosen to make uh, them do nothing when, when they're executed at compile time, so we don't get an error. Um, but at the runtime, they will still work. So at runtime, what you get on the screen there is Hello World 5, which is basically uh, 2 plus 3. And we can also fit this within a, a static assert as well. So we can check that 5 is equal to x. And if it is, then if we've got that within a static assert, that will run fine. Um, so we, we looked at uh, a project um, within but it's included within quite, quite a large amount of work that is, uh, comes along with the MetaMath uh, project. So um, the URL for MetaMath is, is there. It's a good project. Um, it uh, is a few things. It's a, a small formal language to express, uh, express math theorems. Um, and it's accompanied by proofs and tools for the verification of those proofs. There's over a dozen proof verifiers listed at uh, the, the MetaMath website, which you can have a look at. But for us, we were interested in the, the main, I think it's the only perhaps C++ version that, that is there, that's been there for uh, well over 10 years. It's um, written in C++ by Eric Schmidt. It's called CheckMM. Um, 
when you look at it, it's a lot of things that are ideal for our, our endeavors here. We've got 1400 lines of C++ in one source file. It makes extensive use of the C++ standard library. Um, 14 headers are at the top there. Um, we've got containers being used, Q, string, set, DQ, vector, pair, and map. So um, a, a nice selection, including some that are now supported uh, with an STD namespace, but others that require the say namespace. So for us, it's uh, a focus on say. Um, we also have in, in, in that project, we've got the, the C++ standard algorithm library set intersection and find functions being used. And we've also got IO operations involving STD, CO, and CR, and other assorted standalone functions. So our project just puts CT uh, at the start of that, CT check MM, and the URL for that is there. The changes we had to make to check MM are listed below, at least the, the highlights. Um, certainly, we added the context for qualifier to all the functions that were involved. But the next thing we did for step two is we changed all the global variables to class members of a, a newly created struct uh, called check MM that we, we created to, to get that um, working for us. Um, because we, we chose that approach in preference to you know, adding a const extra before um, all of these um, variables. It seemed like a, a lighter a touch to the, the alterations. Then free functions, uh, which is what they all are in this um, project, uh, at least before we got to it, uh, they're all changed to members of that simple struct that I mentioned. Um, we had one static function scope variable, which was also changed to a class member and handled appropriately. Um, compile time file IO is not possible. Uh, in particular, we uh, had to make an alteration to one of the existing functions there, read tokens. Um, it now accepts a second string parameter, which is used if it isn't empty, and that allows us the flexibility to maintain um, the, the code so that it still runs at runtime and at compile time. File includes within the MM database files that we will be uh, parsing are not supported when processing at compile time, an exception is thrown if this occurs. So we, we don't handle that yet, and we don't have that in the, the projects that we've been looking at. Um, and the exception being thrown, you know, an, a, a thrown exception is illegal within a const extra program, but it is very useful because you can have your a message that explains what has gone wrong in that exception. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's quite convenient. Uh, we use say headers, so anything that was something like hash include vector uh, is now hash include say vector dot hpp and so on. And we also have a script because uh, the input files, the, the metamath database files that we're using, need a little bit of alteration to allow us to hash include them, basically. So we have a script that places C++11 style raw string literal delimiters before and after the mm file contents. And after that, when we're, we're using uh, that file, we would then access uh, that file's contents using a preprocessor macro, mm file path, and that's then set to the script's output. So with the script input of piano.mm, we would have a, an output of piano.mm.raw, perhaps, and uh, then we would just pass that extra um, um, component to the uh, command line invocation. This is just a, a glimpse into the mechanism of that. Um, this just shows the, the, the main function, essentially, and one other function to give you an idea. Um, if we look at the, the main function over here, um, you know, the parts that are runtime are a little, uh, they're, they're probably cl far closer to what was originally there. So what's happening here is it's just checking to see if the argument count is as expected. It should be that a, um, a metamath database file is provided to be checked by this, this program, um, and otherwise it returns an error. Then we've got the static assert at runtime. You know, that that's, there's no cost at runtime. It just comes down here at runtime, and the app was created because we created a, this as a, as a struct now or a simple class. We then call app.run, and we give the, 
the parameter provided by the user to check and the code runs at runtime as it did. It's the static assert that's been added. And so over here, you can see a little bit more about the function that's been brought in here, CE app run. And here we've got a check MM app being created. And then we've got a little bit of macro magic going on here. So we've got a say string text, which has been initialized um, by hash including the, the MM file path. And we use X str here, which you can see defined there and there uh, is required to make the, the macros happy. And now we call app.run here. And we're over here, we were passing the, the file name as the, the first argument to run, which has got two parameters, but one's a default. But here we don't, we pass uh, an empty string for the first parameter, we pass in txt here, which is now a say string. And we have a little bit of handling of uh, of the fact that this is uh, not a, a default value coming in to uh, the run member function. And all, if all goes well, then we're going to hopefully end up with Rhett having uh, exit success. But if the user doesn't provide MM file path, we also accommodate that with the else there. And they just the return is then e exit success. And that means that the static assert is not going to get in the way of anyone who's somehow using this code to verify uh, runtime. Um, MetaMath databases. And the, my last slide is just uh, looking at a little bit of benchmarking. Um, I'm just using the time uh, function, uh, the, the Unix time function here. There you can see the spec of my old machine. I'm using that version of GCC and that version of Clang that's identified there. Um, we have bigger files than these. You can see we're working with uh, something called demo0.mm, which you can find on the, the MetaMath website, and same with piano.mm. You can see the size of these. Um, then you can see how long it takes to actually run them. Um, piano a little bit longer. It's obviously a more substantial file. Compile times. So for the small one, it's with GCC, it's 2.3. With Piano, it's um, 8.4. With Clang on the on the demo uh, .mm file, it's 2.45 seconds. Um, with Piano .mm, it's up to 14 seconds, which is um, certainly uh, a bit longer than uh, Piano. Um, sorry, than GCC is taken. Uh, there's the the invocation commands, uh, which which might be uh, of interest. Um, as I say, I was just putting the time command in front of those two invocations. And that is, uh, that's, that's all from me for the moment. So I'm going to hand over to Jules now. Uh, so can everyone see my screen already? Yep. Okay, perfect. So um in my part of the presentation we are going to see how to go from uh const expert programming so essentially um going from say or standard containers at um in uh, in const expert uh context to uh, actual code generation through templates um so to go from dynamically allocated values uh to code we can uh well, stick to trivially typed results and use uh, dynamically allocated containers for the computations. Um, and then just return, of course, uh, stud arrays or POD types, et cetera. Um, in the future, we might be able to use um, other techniques like reflection and splicing, which are essentially um, procedural uh, code generation where you can reflect expressions and splice them back into a function or a structure or anything else. Um, there is, there might be uh, the prop const uh, qualifier, which might allow for um, data transfer from uh, const expert contexts to um, runtime contexts. Um, and if you're a bit more adventurous, you might uh, also try to use Circle, uh, which has a lot of metaprogramming features. Um, but we're going to stick to C20, um, uh, to what's available in C20. Um, so we are going to see how to use um, non trivial types, such as stud vector or say vector, and 
actually freeze them into uh, stud arrays. Um, there is a technique that allows you to um, to, to get uh, stud arrays of the right size. Um, or we are going to see also another technique, which is which consists in um, wrapping your uh, results in context per lambdas, um, which allows you to explore, let's say, uh, pointer trees and so on. Um, so we're also going to see how these techniques uh, how these techniques perform, and for that we have a uh, case study, which is the meta compilation um, of a very basic structured language, which you might already know. It's BrainFark. So the spec of the language is like very simple. Um, on the left, you have uh, the tokens. So there are single characters tokens. Um, and on the right, you have the C equivalent. So we just basically have a chunk of, of memory, a pointer that we can increase or decrease. We can increase or decrease the value pointed by the pointer. We have very basic AO, uh, IO, sorry. And um, we also have a very basic while loop. So this language is Turing complete. So you might be able to do any kind of computation you want with it, although you might not want to do it, but you, you can. Um, and uh, I have a meta compiler implementation available on GitHub if you want to have a look at it. Uh, this is the one uh, I am, this is the one I used uh, in the test uh, that uh, that we'll see later. Um, and the language is actually parsed from a context per string uh, into an AST with uh, three uh, sorry uh, pointer trees that rely on, uh, say, uh, unique PTR. So we are actually using the kind of data structures that you would like to use for a uh, classical uh, compiler, one, does, uh, one that, uh, sorry, does not run at compile time. So the first technique to um, bring your data over from constexpert to NTTP is um, converting them uh, into a vector. Uh, I mean, basically serializing them into, into a vector and then um, converting that vector, freezing it into an R. So here we have um, a code that allows us to um, essentially evaluate um, a function into an R. So we assume that fun returns a stud vector. Uh, so we can just get uh, the type of the value from it and then we get uh, the size into a um, a context per uh, variable. Uh, so this is doable because, well, the uh, the return type of fun is not um, is not uh, sorry it's, is not trivial, but fun dot size is trivial, so we can store it in a context per variable. So we can then use uh, this context per variable to give a size to the array template type. And um, all we have to do from there is uh, copy the content of fun uh, into the array. And then we can return it. And because uh, this is a trivial, um, trivial type, uh, we can then store it um, in a context per value and use it as a non-type template parameter for code generation. Um, so yeah, the only caveat is that uh, it requires data serialization. And by the way, you can uh, take a look at this code in action uh, on this Godbull link. Uh, so you do need to serialize your data. So you must have um, a, uh, a uh, trivial equivalent of your data. So all you have to do is uh, to use a stud variant to take care of the polymorphism and uh, replace pointers with indexes uh, within uh, the um, within the, the, the vector. So the trick uh, to convert a vector into an array uh, was shown to me by Luke D'Alessandro. So thanks a lot to him. And uh, there's his GitHub in the, in the slide. OK, so another technique that's uh, way trickier, but um, I would say maybe a bit more powerful, or at least it doesn't require you to uh, serialize your data, is to wrap your uh, results into uh, into lambdas. So here again, we get the size into a context per value, um, and we use it to generate an indexed sequence. 
Um, and from that index sequence, uh, we can unroll um, template parameter, uh, sorry, um, we can unroll a bunch of index and just uh, gather all the data into a tuple. So these techniques allows you to eventually um, call Evada's tuple uh, into it recursively to um, to explore pointer trees, uh, tree point, pointer tree, sorry. And uh, eventually you have a tuple tree. Uh, it allows you to have uh, polymorphic values uh, without stud variant. So you might actually um, unwrap the, the types from uh, from a variant if you if you use them. Um, and um, yeah, you basically have a an expression template at this point with values stored in the in the tuple. Uh, so again, I gave a link to a code example showing how it works uh, in uh, in Compiler Explorer. Uh, so yeah, the advantages of these techniques uh, of this technique is that you don't uh, need to serialize your data. Um, your values can have uh, different types, uh, unlike uh, with uh, uh, stud array, but stud array can be uh, can use uh, can use variant too, so that's pretty much uh, a non-issue. Um, and the huge downside is that uh, this will basically blow up your computer because, um, well, the complexity of this task is actually quadratic because you have to call um, the function every time you want to access um, to access an element. So this is a huge problem. And we can see it in performance measurements. So here we have um, the two backends of the BrainFog compiler uh, benchmarks. So in one case, uh, so we have two benchmarks. We have um, a benchmark where we try to compile consecutive loops. And we have another one where, where we just imbricate the loops uh, to make um, yeah, to make just uh, a bunch of uh, loops stacked together. Um, and then we have the two backends. We have the ET backend for uh, the Pass by Land uh, technique and the flat backend for the serialized AST uh, technique. So the two curves that explode, the, the violet, uh, violet one, purple, sorry, and the green one are the ones that rely on uh, the Pass by Lambda technique. So you can clearly see that it dramatically increases um, like um, actually very fast, and uh, the two backend, I mean the the two um, benchmarks uh, that rely on the uh, serialized AST backend um, are much more like they grow much much slower, and they're actually pretty much linear. Uh, and this is again something we're going to see uh, with other benchmarks. And uh, by the way, if you want to extract data um, and compile time curves from um, from benchmarks, you can use uh, my CityBench tool, which is um, a suite of tools, uh, CMake tools and C++ tools to um, run the compiler a few times, uh, gather sample uh, sample data, and aggregate them into into these kind of curves. Um, Okay, so this was actually done automatically, automatically using uh, CityBench. And uh, we have also other benchmarks uh, that rely, um, that are based on more sophisticated cases. So we have a Hello World program and a Mandelbrot display program. Uh, so the Hello World program has uh, 106 uh, tokens, so that's about 106 uh, AST nodes because, well, one character in uh, in Brentwork is one AST node pretty much. Um, and when we look at the serialized AST backend, um, the timings scale pretty well. Uh, so we have 1.6 seconds for the Hello World program. If we repeat that, so if we just chain them together, we get uh, 1.9 uh, seconds of compile time. But when we look at uh, the lambda wrapping technique, it's uh, it becomes pretty um, pretty much not, might, no, sorry nightmarish as the size of the program increases. So uh, at first it's 6.8 seconds, uh, which is still okay. But uh, when we double the size of the program, we effectively uh, quadruple uh, the compile time. So again, we're pretty much in uh, we have pretty much um, quadratic uh, compile times. So we're pretty much uh, stuck with the Lambda and wrapping technique. And when you look at uh, very large programs, such as the Mandelbrot um, 
visualization program, which is about 11,000 um, uh, tokens or AST nodes. Uh, the serialized AST uh, backend can just uh, compile it in less than 40 seconds, and the uh, Lambda wrapping uh, backend uh, simply won't compile on my machine. So by the way, this is uh, the machine I, I run these tests on is um, is a laptop. It has a uh, 6300U uh, processor and 8 gigs of RAM. So it's not a big one, but uh, still I try to test uh, to compile this overnight and uh, I had a I had a Clang, uh, Clang timeout. And uh, if we double the size of the program in the serialized AST, uh, version it uh, it holds up uh, pretty well and again the lambda wrapping technique just uh, uh, just fails uh, at this benchmark. So to sum it up, um, for the I would say the the meat of uh, of your program I would simply recommend to just uh, use any kind of data structure you want uh, thanks to the say library. Um, and then just serialize it into a vector uh, to freeze it into an std array. Um, and then just use this std array as an NTTP for code generation. It's actually fairly easy. Uh, try to stick with a um, template uh, layer of code as minimal as, uh, as minimal as possible, as you really don't want to write uh, too much uh, template code. And um, you can test your context per functions at runtime. It's actually very useful. This is what I'm doing uh, um, whenever I can in my uh, in my meta programs. And uh, you also want to make sure that your functions um, still run at compile time. So you actually want to have some kind of context per compatible test uh, to make sure that everything's in check. Um, OK, so that's all for me. I think we can uh, switch over to Andrew. OK. Uh, let's see. So hopefully my yep, slides are viewable. Um, so I'm Andrew, Andrew Guzion, and I have been working on a Parallelization compiler for Constexper. Um, so the idea behind this is that as Constexper com becomes more widely used, the performance of all these features are going to become a bit more of a concern as compile time features already can sort of raise compile times significantly when they're used. Um, as you can see in some of the larger projects where uh, compilation takes a significantly long time when templates and things like that are used quite um, vastly. So the idea is that we'd like to take a little look at increasing the performance of these kind of features through parallelization. And in this case, it's through Expert. So if it works for runtime, then we want to kind of see if it can, it can be extended to compile time and work there just as well. Um, so Clang OS was created um, by me. Um, it's a Clang compiler which adds extensions for parallelizing context for for loops. Uh, essentially, uses um, intrinsics to partition uh, workloads from for loops across multiple CPUs, um, and then run them in parallel. But this kind of means that the parallelization is explicit rather than implicit. It requires users to sort of understand their algorithm and how they want it to be split across the CPUs and parallelized uh, rather than implicit, uh, where it would be essentially um, automatically done by the compiler. So there is still a bit of work done to be required to be done by users. Um, so here is the GitHub link to the Clangos compiler. So it is accessible and usable just now, um, although the readme is not quite all there yet, um, but if, as long as you send me an email or so, uh, I can always point you in the right direction. Um, but the readme should be up there soon enough. Um, but as a research compiler, so um, don't be using it for any production uses. Um, so essentially, let's have a look at the compiler magic behind this parallelization process. Um, in essence, in, it, in essence, it is using intrinsic functions, but they're not actually Clang intrinsics. They are essentially function wrappers that the, the Clang compiler has been taught to recognize at the moment. Um, but in the future, hopefully, they'll be converted to intrinsics. Um, but here is a for each 
from well, it's slightly modified from libc plus um, plus. So it's, it's a bit neater. That's all. It's really changed, and some um, intrinsics have been added to this um, function. So it's your standard standard library for each. Um, and in this case, it's just going to iterate over a bunch of elements from a container and provided. It, it, and the function gets provided a first and a last parameter, which is the beginning and end of your container, and a function which will be um, applied onto each element of your uh, container. And in this case, we have two intrinsics. The first is begin end iterator pair, which essentially takes um, two arguments, the first and the last iterator, and it is specifying to the compiler that these are the beginning and end elements of the loop that you will be parallelizing. And this is so the compiler knows how to calculate the partitioning and appropriately separate all the um, loop across each um, CPU. And then you have reduce variable, which I have stated sums the final values of first, which isn't necessarily the right way to put it, and neither is reduce necessarily the, possibly the best name for it. Um, in essence, it's just going to assign or recombine all the partitioned elements. So when my or when the compiler is splitting um, the containers data across, it's going to clone each um, segment of data that is going to pass across to each CPU or yeah, each thread essentially. And uh, these then need to be recombined back into the original um, container essentially. Um, so this is what that is essentially doing. And in this case, it was just variable is basically saying um, here is the container, which is first. And it, is the begin iterator notated by the begin iterator first, and here is how we want to then um, recombine these slash reduce these uh, using partition, partitioned order assign, which is essentially just going to assign each element back to the container in order that it was um, looked over, and then we have pre ink, which is basically stating this was the order that these were um, looked over essentially, and it's the same as the plus plus first of the for loop. So it's basically just saying parse this in order, essentially, um, going from left to right when you're assigning everything back. Um, so it's not too complicated. Um, and it is somewhat reminiscent, I guess, of OpenMP, if slightly more complexity added to it due to the reduced variable. But the begin and end iterator pair, I think, is sort of similar to, in concept, at least, to OpenMP and the general ideas. Um, so how do we sort of hide this pesky compiler magic? Because then um, people don't really, or not everybody is going to want to necessarily deal with um, compiler intrinsics to get their algorithms or the parallelization from their algorithms. Um, so it's good for library users to be able to hide this behind something. Um, so they can then give these parallelized algorithms to users who are less interested in the details and more interested in actually getting the results from it. Um, so we, in this case, so it's possible, but in this case, we've sort of used um, executors, the executors proposal, because um, we kind of think it synergizes these quite well with um, the idea of parallelization of um, const expert um, elements. And it sort of also works to hide the serial or to discriminate or to separate serial and const expert function or parallelize const expert functions from each other is quite nice. Um, so you'll see, below in these, this code segment. There is two standard for each's. Um, the first is your basic just um, serial standard for each. And we're going to pretend that these two for each's are inside of a context per context, essentially, so they'll be evaluated in context per rather than just at runtime. Um, so yeah, bear with me with that. Um, and essentially, the first standard for each is just your standard for each. So it's going to iterate over every element of an array and multiply it by two. And then the below one is your const expert parallelized one, uh, which is going to iterate over each element in parallel and multiply it by two, essentially, of the whole array in parallel. So it's going to split it into let's say four, if you get four cores essentially, and then multiply them. And that's sort of a very simple distinction um, to separate the serial const expert and the parallelized const expert. You're essentially just passing an executor argument to the standard for each. And we have um, 30 or so alg algorithms at the moment uh, in Clang OS um, and a modified lib 
CXX um, that basically just uh, parallelize and accept these executors that and allow um, context for parallelization. Um, so what kind of results can you expect from this? Um, actually, it's surprisingly quite reasonable results. Um, so it's up to 75% peak efficiency um, for some of the benchmarks we've tested on. Um, most of the benchmarks we've tested on are very HPC specific. Um, so they're not very, I wouldn't expect these programs to necessarily be used in a production environment for Quantex were necessarily. We're still kind of looking for the ideal um, scenario for it. Um, but in this case, we used five traditional sort of HPC benchmarks, um, which is basically Black Shoals, Mandelpro, end body and swaptions, and sickle edge detection. In the case of sickle edge detection, uh, the edge detection component is perhaps more HPC uh, benchmark. It's just a sobel edge detection algorithm, but the sickle component is not necessarily um, your traditional uh, HPC, I suppose. Um, so we basically have a not fully complete um, quantity expert sickle implementation that um, allows parallelization um, of or context for parallelization of sickle kernels at um, compile time, which is kind of nice. And we tested that um, its performance essentially using Sobel edge detection. And so all the data is from a four core i5, um, 7600 k So it's a sort of old TPU um, rather than a newer gen um, CPU with um, a ton of performance. And all the data is average across five executions. Um, but from the graph, you can essentially see that it actually performs quite well uh, in most cases with end body essentially sort of reaching the speed up. Um, but first and foremost, um, this is a speed up graph essentially. So uh, at the bottom, you've got a number of threads and then the left, you have the speed up essentially. So for each thread, you're essentially wanting, um, or you'd hope the ideal scenario is that you get exactly 100% performance or one speed up per thread. Um, and in this case, you can see that it is not exactly the same all the way across. So we do not reach the ideal speed up in all cases, but I believe in most cases that is very unlikely, um, even at runtime or even on a runtime code. Uh, and in this case, it is essentially showcasing that the end bodies actually very close to the, the normal speed up and then all the other ones sort of fall a little bit short, but they still actually have very significant performance increases um, across the board. And that is it for me. So I'm going to pass it over to Joe. So thanks, Andrew. So as a quick conclusion, um, we wanted to show that there is a lot of things going on in the context world, especially around the fact that context for allocation and uh, uh, abstraction inside a standard library container style of codes like CES is doing uh, shows that it can actually get great results on non-trivial uh, use cases and uh, the discovery and refinement on other runtime to compile time conversion schemes also help a lot to go through complex uh, piece of code. Uh, the management of compile time uh, is by actually going, you know, um, all, all the way to Elven by parallelizing the compiler, which is quite a novel approach to the problem, or by trying to bridge the gap into a uh, compile time programming tools like CityBench does, uh, shows that we need more tools to make compile time programming a more mainstream a way of dealing with all, all the, um, the issues uh, that still are um, to be solved. All in all, uh, we shown that uh, we can manage complexity uh, in context world by using those tools and those libraries uh, up to getting a non-trivial uh, workload to be uh, optimized and run at compile time. And the final word, uh, there is, uh, we want to thank the uh, RSC International Collaboration Awards that made this work possible. And also a uh, shout out to um, a bunch of cool people like Michael Bolt for its uh, Compare Explorer things that helped us a lot. And Jonathan Wakeley's, uh, which was uh, able to uh, give us access to a bunch of uh, binary package so we can actually work properly. Um, thanks for your attention. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk and uh, see you next time. Thank you for your talk. Um, so let me get this straight. So no, okay. Thank you for your talk. That was really interesting. Um, I think there are a lot of questions um, which 
some of them probably have been handled in the chat during this talk. Um, if you have further questions, there is a table in the lounge to you know handle that, and uh, the speakers will be at the table for uh, you to have questions in a debate with.